sorry about that okay so um welcome to our uh july blue monkey event um thanks for joining us and um, we're really happy to see everyone here um and i think we should kick off and introduce our speaker afra shemza who's joining us from kent sunny kent i think it will be um and we're really pleased to have her here today um she's a london-based multimedia artist and the granddaughter of anvar shemza her work explores modernism her islamic cultural heritage sustainable practice and creating art for all as an artist and activist, she finds ambitious ways to fuse methodologies from the past with new innovations in technology to imagine what the role of art could be in the future. Alongside her practice, Afra is the manager of the estate of Anvar Jalal Shamsa and an expert in his work. In 2016, um, she contributed an article to Tate Etc, which coincided with a spotlight display of his work at Tate Britain, and she is currently cataloguing the estate archive. Afra is also director and curator at Art in Flux, a community interest community committed to furthering the development of the media arts through talks, exhibitions, workshops and more. So thanks Afra for joining us this evening. And I'm going to hand over and I'll just say that <clears throat> perhaps we could have Q&A at the end. Does that sound good? Um, or maybe if people want to put questions in the chat box and you can kind of go through them, whatever's easiest for you. OK, I'm going to hand over the floor. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Stephanie. It's so lovely to be here with everyone this evening. Um, I'm just going to share my screen because I've got some slides pre prepared for this. So, um, yeah, Stephanie did a really good job of summing up my first couple of slides. So I'll whiz through them a little bit, uh, which was my bio, really. So I'm Afra Shemza. I'm a multimedia artist. Um, manager of the estate of Amber Jalal Shemza and director at Art in Flux. So um, here you can see some images of some of my own works and obviously we've got one behind me here as well. I combine light and technology with um, traditional sculpture and create artworks that sort of change over time and interact with the viewer and the space around them. So I'm also the manager of the estate and I'm currently cataloguing the estate archive and running a project called Shemza Digital, which I'm going to share with you a bit later on in the talk. I've been running the estate since I graduated in 2012 from art school, and I've been working alongside our galleries, Javeri Contemporary and Hales. The estate's main aim is to provide a platform for my grandfather's works. We loan uh, works for exhibitions, we make the archive available for scholars to read and look at his work, we take part in international art fairs, publish books and place his works in public collections around the world so that everyone can see them. So in this talk I'm going to introduce you to the work of Van Vashemza, I'll talk to you about some key moments in his career, talk through some of his different series, and introduce you to Shemza Digital as well, the latest estate project that I'm working on. So here, here he is, here's my grandfather, Amba Shemza. So he unfortunately died three years before I was born. So I didn't get a chance to meet him, but I've always had a real connection with him through his art. I've grown up surrounded by his paintings in our family home, and I've often been inspired by them. I found like, in, at the same age he began his artistic journey, I also began mine in my life. And what is, has excited me the most about his work was how he stands apart from the Western artists I've studied throughout my sort of traditional fine art education. Particularly the way he fused ideas of Western abstraction with Eastern influences and cultural heritage from Pakistan. So I'm going to talk you through some of um, Shems's biography and then I'll talk you through a bit of the series in the middle of that and then come back again to the biography just so we can break up the chronology of it all. So um, Anva was born in Shimla in Kashmir and studied at the Mayo School of Art in Lahore, which is now the National College of the Arts. And he was there from 1944 to 1947. He achieved widespread recognition in Pakistan for his lyrical figurative works that drew inspiration from Mughal and Hindu themes, 
And here you can see a work called The Couple, which is from the estate collection. And it's one of our the earliest works in the collection that we have. And it's very different to the work that you'll see of Shemza's um, later on in the presentation. So here we can see the work has a kind of traditional miniature painting style with a sort of flat composition and a very, um, a very favorite theme for sort of the lovers in traditional miniature painting. So in 1952, um, Anva was the founding member of the Lahore Art Circle, and this was a group that was concerned with modernism and abstraction, and it was really, really forward thinking for the, uh, for the early 50s in, in that area of the world. It included artists like Ahmed Parvez and Ali Imam. And the Lahore Art Circle group and a work by Shemza are going to be shown in the group dynamics show at the Lembach House in Munich later this year. So you can watch out for, for more information about that. So Anva came over to London in 1956 to study at the Slade School of Fine Art. And on his arrival in the UK, his Pakistani artistic achievements weren't recognized and he really struggled to find a place for himself here. His art history lecturer was the really well-regarded Ernst Gombrich, and he published the story of art, which you can see on the left there, in 1950. And this was a history of art, really, from an entirely Western point of view. So it wasn't very surprising then, in one of his lectures, my grandfather was really dismayed to hear Ernst Gombrich dismiss all Islamic art as being purely functional. And this was a real turning point for him. He went home that evening and he destroyed all the work that he had created so far in the UK. He then began an exploration of the modernist abstraction of Paul Clay, Mondrian and Kandinsky. And here on the right hand side, you can see a seminal work from the estate collection called Still Life. And in this painting, you can really see a shift from figuration to abstraction where the cups and fruit elements in this painting are becoming more abstract and they are starting to turn into the circles and semicircles that Anva becomes really well known for later on in his life. This work and another work from the family collection are going to be on show in London next year as part of the Barbican's new post-war exhibition. So if you're interested, do make a note of that and check it out if you're in town next year. I think the dates are still to be completely confirmed as everything's all still up in the air a little bit, isn't there at the moment. So Amber decided to go back to basics at this point, and he wanted to combine the simplified formal language of these artists, Paul Clay, Mondrian, Kandinsky, Western abstraction, with Islamic architecture and calligraphy to create his own unique style. Or as he put it, which is inscribed in Urdu in this painting, one circle, one square, one problem, one life is not enough to solve it, which is a rather brilliant quote, I think. So in this artwork, one to nine and one to seven, we can see a kind of abstract formula, which details the shapes and compositions that Shemza would use going forward in his practice for the rest of his life. And we can see it's a combination of the square and the circle, and then kind of derivatives from those shapes. During Anva's time in London, he exhibited alongside many other Commonwealth artists, such as Fran Francis Newton Souza, who some of you may well know, and Avinash Chandra. And he had solo shows at Victor Musgrave's Progressive Gallery One and the New Vision Center in the late 50s, early 60s. And it's quite interesting to note that both Souza and Chandra, who are mm, quite better known than Shemza, they moved to New York to further their careers at the, uh, just after this time. And London was, the London's art market was really dominated by American abstract expressionism. So it was quite difficult for an abstract artist to really make their way um, when it was so dominated with that style of work in the UK. So I'll come back to the Shemza's biography shortly, but I just want to splinter off now and speak a little bit more about the different series of work that he worked on throughout his lifetime. And I won't have time to go into every single one, but I've picked out some real juicy ones for you and I'll highlight a few key series that will introduce you to his practice. 
So the square composition series is one of my favourite series. And in this series, Shems have created a total of 14 works and they're all in the same dimensions in the same square format. And I think with this series, you really get a sense of how he starts to combine Western modernism with his Eastern influences. So in square composition three, which you can see on the left, you can feel the shapes almost taking on architectural forms, perhaps with minarets and turrets and archways. In square composition seven, which is in the middle here, you can see the B and D calligraphy from the Roman alphabet and the use of colour that relates almost directly, I think, to the topography that's used in the Bauhaus era. In square composition 10, we see a return to the basic circle inside the square. And I just want to point out this texture as well that's in the paint on the left, actually in all the paintings here. Um, Schemser often used textiles and textures in his painted works. And these specific textures, they have a kind of marbled effect almost with creases, were created by um, Anva painting a layer of paint over the surface of the board and then letting that dry. And then he would paint another layer over the top, scrumple up lots of newsprint, um, lay that out all over the surface of the wet paint, the second layer, and then he would walk across the painting within his flip-flops um, to bring out some of the paint um, into the newsprint and it creates these really beautiful textures. So there's a kind of really interesting embodied quality to some of the processes that Schemser was using to make his work. In the meme series, Schemser uses the Arabic letter M which look like, it looks like a backwards P shape, which you can see in the piece on the left there to create these different compositions. And they sometimes uh, represent plant forms like in meme one, which is the one on the left. These works are going to be included in an exhibition next year at Tate Liverpool, which is all about the British landscape. So do look out for that one as well. The meme series uses the letter M, which is the first letter of the Prophet Muhammad's name in the Muslim faith. So it's related to Islam almost certainly, but it's also the first letter of my grandmother's name too. Um, her name is Mary. And for our family, meme one takes on a really particular and um, sentimental meaning as my mother Tazvir, who some of you may know, have had this design iced on her wedding cake when she got married to my dad. And they now have a stained glass version of it in the front door of our family home in Eastbourne. So you might have even seen it. Um, you can see sometimes these paintings have a more sentimental value to our family on top of them being such great artworks. And I'm really, really privileged to have been surrounded with them my whole life. I've just seen there might have been something coming in on the chat, but whilst I'm sharing my screen, I'm not able to see the chat. But Stephanie, if you ever, if you want to jump in, if there's any questions or we can answer them at the end, depending on how it how it feels. Um, let me have a quick look. Uh, um, it was to do with his palette. Is that a, a color palette? I suppose was it? In, did it? Was it influenced or changed with his move with his move to London and the weather, the British weather? I don't know if you want to answer that at the end. <laughs> um, <laughs> He always did very uh, sort of vibrant colours. The use of red and green, it was really, um, the use of these reds and greens is really kind of important in his work. I think a lot of that is to do with his heritage of being in Pakistan. I'm not really sure how much of the colour was really translated into the, from the UK. Um, yeah, I feel like it was, there was quite a good sense of the colours and the colours that he wanted to use before he came here. But of course, these, these strong, bold, pri more primary colours uh, are seen a lot, aren't they, in Western abstraction as well um, within those artists' works. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure if it was from being in the UK, though. Um, cool. Yeah, we can just answer questions like that if that, if that works. Stephanie, I just can't see those going through. So, and this is a bit of a treat. So I've included some elements from the archive. So this is one of Shems's sketchbooks where he worked on his ideas um, for the meme series. So you can see a page here. 
And here he's drawing out his different designs and trying to choose which paint, which he's going to make into paintings. So you can see there's a tick on one of the on one of the designs that has made it in, that's going to make it into a painting. And he's sort of trying to figure things out. Some of these sketchbooks are going to be exhibited at the Whitechapel Gallery next year for an exhibition on the artist studio curated by Hamad Nasser. Um, so do check that out as well if you're in town. In the Magic Carpet series, you can see how the more bold abstract compositions of some of these other works that I've shown you become much more fluid and more complex. They kind of weave across the canvases more fluidly and they almost look like a woven pattern. So Anvar's family were carpet makers in Pakistan, so the textures are almost certainly related to that. And in this series, the composition is laid out like that of a prayer rug pointing to Mecca. Anva used textiles, as I've mentioned quite often within his work. He sort of pasted them to boards and he often loved to display the frayed edges, which gave this really interesting kind of textile quality to his work. And, and definitely sort of is an interesting way of working with paintings and textiles um, in terms of abstract works. I think I might have skipped a slide then. Sorry, just go back to that. In Shems's Love Letter series from 1969, you see a similar weave-like composition. But here we can also see some more abstract and bold figures in red, some of which almost look like reclining figures. And they also have a kind of strange hieroglyphic quality to them, as if they're a sort of secret language, secret language of love that's been laid out across the canvas. Shemza was really keen on visiting the British Museum whilst he was at, at university. He loved the Egyptian section and I feel there's a sort of synergy here between some of these ideas and the ancient writing in these pieces. They also seem to relate as well to medieval manuscripts that he might have seen in the British Museum too. What these in medieval manuscripts they often have illuminated letters that are set set into a textural page. So we can really start to see here the fusion of the East and the West in this series. And Shemza did also stray a lot into figurative compositions too. So within the City Wall series, he's showing city walls, domes, architecture, minarets, archways, and they also, they're definitely related to Islamic architecture that he would have seen in Pakistan. And you can also see in these paintings, moons, suns and stars in the sky relating to astrology. And the grass you can see on both is quite psychedelic, I think, these paintings. It's quite interesting the way in which he's been working on those in the 60s. One of my personal favourites is the Chessmen series. So the first piece here is now placed in the Tate's permanent collection. So it may well be on display when you next go there. I think it was hanging in Tate Britain. In the Chessmen series, Amber uses these circles and semicircles and squares to create chessmen. And they have a kind of horizontal line that situates them within the landscape of the artworks. They also sort of seem to remind me of family groupings. So you have kind of a king and a queen and the other, the other chess pieces. And in some of Shemza's works, he entitles some of the artworks that are similar to this, family one or family two. So there's this kind of idea that the chess pieces are also related to figures standing in a plane. And here again, you can see an expert from one of Amber's sketchbooks where he's planning out his chess figures and giving them numbers so he can get a real sense of what he's going to use in his compositions moving forward. So coming back again to Shemza's biography and the chronology of his life, Shemza married my grandmother, Mary Taylor, in 1958. And Mary is still very much alive today and is still painting in Eastbourne. She takes part in open houses and has exhibited most recently at the Burley Centre. So you may have even seen some of her work there. And this is one of her pieces on the right and her website's there if you're interested to check it out, what she's been up to. 
So Anva and Mary had their first child, Tasveer, my mum, um, a year later, and Anva moved to West Midlands and joined the teaching staff at Stafford College. And this meant that he worked in isolation for quite a long time, um, isolated from the London art scene. But whilst he was doing that, he rigorously created his own inimitable style and exhibited internationally at drawing and print biennials across the world. And many people don't know so much about Shems's printmaking, but he was also an accomplished printmaker. After he graduated from the Slade, he was awarded a scholarship by the British Council, where he learned how to print with the accomplished printmaker, Anthony Gross. He continued to develop his practice throughout his life, working in both black and white and colored etchings and later in screen printing. And often Shems's series, he didn't necessarily work on them at specific times throughout his life. Um, he comes, he visits these themes in different mediums and across the many years that he was working. So the meme series, he'll come back to that in the, some you know, screen prints and prints later on. And the City Walls series kind of darts around as well. So he's not just working on one series for one part of his life. Whilst Anvil was teaching in Stafford College, he, he created this relief series, which is quite different from a lot of his other works as well. So here he salvaged old tables and chair legs out of a skip at school and cut them up and glued them to these hardboard back or chipboard backboards um, and to form these textured compositions. And you don't necessarily get a sense from the images, but the, the level of the tables and chair legs are kind of raised at different levels. So they have a kind of topography to them. So the final series that Shemza worked on was called Roots. And here you can see that the content is quite different from many of the more abstract works that I've shown you so far. So in these works, we see a plant-like form or flower coming out of the ground and its roots are going into the earth. The roots themselves are quite like Arabic calligraphy, um, but they don't say anything that's legible. They're a sort of calligraphic abstraction. And these two works show two different styles from the four main styles of Arabic calligraphy. So on the right, you can see Kufic, which, which is a more angular style of calligraphy. And on the left, you can see Naqsh, which is, which is a curlier style of calligraphy. Anva, unfortunately, never made it to Pakistan as he died suddenly. And um, he was due to do an exhibition of these artworks in Pakistan, and they were all made a uh, small size so that they could be fitted into his, his and my grandmother's suitcase and taken over there um, to do an exhibition. But he unfortunately died very suddenly of a heart attack in 1985. My grandmother Mary did take the works to Pakistan after his death and did a touring memorial exhibition across the country. Um, and that was a really great way to showcase his work and kind of pay a tribute to him as well and continue that. So my grandfather never got to see his work hanging in Tate or unfortunately achieve much recognition in his lifetime. And this was mainly due to the kind of old colonial attitudes that dominated British art and culture at the time. And of course, there was a lot of institutional racism. A few years after his death, his work was shown in a seminal exhibition, which was called The Other Story at the Hayward Gallery in 1989. And this, this exhibition was conceived and curated by the Pakistani artist and activist Rashid Arayim, and it included work by Eddie Chambers, Sonia Boyce, Avinash Chandra and Mona Hatoum, to name but a few. I'm sure you probably all know some of those names. Shemza's The Wall from 1958 was the cover image from the catalogue and it was probably a sort of homage to Shemza as Rashid and him had met each other previously and Shemza couldn't be at the exhibition. This catalogue can be viewed, I've been told, in the Towner archive, uh, in the Towner library. So you can go and check out that and see some installation shots and things from the show and find out a bit more about the other artists that are involved. 
And I think it's really interesting, this show, because it would have been the first time that many migrant artists would have, who came over to London in the 50s, 60s, 70s, would have had their work exhibited in a major institution. So it's really groundbreaking. And it's very interesting, I think, to note that although this exhibition was a major breakthrough, it exhibited all of these black artists together um, for their otherness rather than um, exhibiting them for the content of their work. And many artists such as Anish Kapoor, who I'm sure many of you know, um, he has Indian heritage. They actually refused to be a part of this show because they saw themselves as British and they became part of a kind of unhinged contemporary art artist art world in the UK, quoting the curator Hamad Nassar. And I think that's that's a really interesting thing to think about how that how that sort of plays with diaspora and feelings of place and heritage and what people call home um, and those kind of ideas. And really, since 1989, there was a, a huge lull in progress in exhibiting these artists work until the last 10 years. So in the last decade, there's been a rethinking of the place of migrant artists within British art history. And artists who came over to the UK in the 50s and 60s, such as Frank Bowling, Avinash Chandra, Donald Locke, David Madala, and many more are now being given the recognition that they so surely deserve. And we're finding ourselves in a period of reflection where the old colonial attitudes that once dominated London's art world for many years are being challenged and British art history is starting to be rethought. And this is reflected in key exhibitions held at major institutions in the last few years, such as Migrations, Journeys into British Art from Tate in 2012. Um, Frank Bowling, there was a retrospective of his a couple of years ago at Tate in 2019. And the radical post-war Art Between the Pacific and the Atlantic, uh, which was held at Haus de Kunst in Munich 2016 to 2017. And in my opinion, Migrations, which was at Tate in 2012, was not that groundbreaking, really. It was pretty much a rehang of the other story, you know, 20, 20 years later. Um, it, but, the, but again, it shows that Tate was starting to put its feet in the right direction, I think. Uh, but the latter, the post-war exhibition that was held at um, Haus de Kunst in Munich, was curated by the late Okri Inwezo, and it sought to reframe the origins of the post-war global order. And this was the first time, to my knowledge, that migrant artists were exhibited alongside some really familiar household famous artist names. So some of Shems's work was very close to Lydia Clark's work in the sort of abstract geometry section. There was uh, Francis Bacon very close to some um, one of Shem's magic carpet works and things like that. So it was a really exciting and groundbreaking show. And the Barbican post-war show next year, I think is going to be doing um, something not dissimilar to that. So starting to rethink um, the post-war art historical context and placing these artists in their kind of rightful places where they should be in the context of what they are working on, why and when at the time. So in 2018, there was an exhibition called Speech Acts, which was held at the Manchester Art Gallery, and it looked into four public national collections in the UK and asked questions about who decides which artists are collected and when their work is exhibited. And this exhibition was really brilliant. And you can see Shems's work is on the left there. It's the yellow and green kind of color that you can see hanging next to Bridget Riley, which I think starts to potentially make a bit more sense. The exhibition was made in conversation with Black Artists and Modernism, which is a research project spearheaded by the artist Sonia Boyce and curated by Hamad Nassar. It was accompanied by a BBC Four programme, which was called Whoever Heard of a Black Artist? And it's actually on iPlayer now, so you can watch that if you're interested in learning a bit more about that show. And uh, it follows Hamad and Sonia whilst they're selecting the works for the exhibition. In 2016, as we've probably mentioned already as well, the estate were invited to exhibit work in a spotlight room display at Tate Britain. We also published the first Shemza monograph, which went alongside the show too. The exhibition was a mini retrospective of Shemza's practice and included painting, 
printmaking alongside archival material. And we placed some work with Tate at the perm in their permanent collection that can now be seen, I think, in both Tate Modern and Tate Britain. And this really sets the scene, I think, for the latest estate project, which is called Shemza Digital, which is funded by the Arts Council England. And um, what I've been talking about, these new advances that, that we're finding in the art world, they're not really commonplace. Um, in school curriculum yet. So members of the public haven't really heard about what's happening um, and institutional changes take quite a long time. And I wanted to find a way to introduce my grandfather's work to the public. And I wanted them to become actively involved in art making themselves as a way to do this. I believe now more than ever in our increasingly polarized society, it's really important that we champion rich and diverse voices within our history. With Shemza Digital, I wanted to create a project that could educate for social change around these issues and celebrate diversity. And I'm going to show you a short video now about the project and then I'll speak to you a little bit more about it and invite you to get involved as well. Oh, just to say, I think the levels of the videos are a little bit lower than my voice has been. So if you wanted to increase your volume just for the videos and then drop it back down <laughs> when I start speaking again, that would be great. My name is Afra Shemza. I'm a multimedia artist who works with light, abstraction and interactivity. My name is Stuart Batchelor and I'm an interactive digital artist who works at the intersection of traditional painting and software art. My grandfather was the well-known painter Anver Jalal Shemza. He came over to London in the 50s from Pakistan and studied at the Slade School of Fine Art. In 1962, my grandfather created a painting called One to Nine and One to Seven. On it, inscribed in Urdu, was the quote, one circle, one square, one problem, one life is not enough to solve it. In Shemza Digital, the artist Stuart Batchelor and myself are continuing the legacy of my grandfather. Inspired by his writings and aesthetics, we are reimagining them through creative technology. It's about making art accessible to everybody. Collaboration is a key part of software art. It can enable anyone to become an artist. We want you to get involved. This piece is about your contribution. We can't wait to see what you'll create. So that gives you a little bit of a sense of the project and I'll now go into it in a little bit more detail. So I've already spoken a little bit about my practice. And um, so this project basically fuses my work and Amber's work together. So in my work, I'm finding ways to fuse methodologies from the past with new innovations to imagine what the role of art could be in the future. And until this project, I've always worked with traditional sculpting techniques, combining them with the latest technology to create my pieces. I'm generally and typically a sculptor and I work with physical materials and I'm working with light, wood, metal and plastic. And due to the pandemic, which I'm sure is the case for many of us, my life and work has been turned upside down. So I wasn't able to exhibit my light sculptures anymore. And I looked for a way that I could take key aspects of my own practice, technology and interactivity, and create a project for the public to participate in whilst they were at home self-isolating. A couple of years ago through Art in Flux, the artist organization that I run, I had the pleasure of meeting Stuart Batchelor, and he came to speak at one of our social events. And since that first meeting, Stuart exhibited with us and even designed a workshop called Painting with Code that we held at the VNA Museum in 2019. I really, really admired Stuart's work and I was looking for a way to collaborate with him and he was the perfect collaborator for this project. He's a media artist who combines traditional painting with um, sorry, who combines traditional art and drawing with creative coding to create paintings that are more than just a surface. They're interactive applications, animated, audible and data driven. At the core of his practice is the idea of what it means to create paintings in the 21st century. 
that is paintings that take advantage of modern technologies. So he's produced many different public facing workshops where participants physical drawings were turned into virtual brushstrokes and they were then able to manipulate them in a 3D application. And this brings physicality and tangibility to the digital painting process. By creating a digital painting software in Shemza Digital, the artists and users can encode their own rules into the system, which allows, which allows them to discover new ways of drawing where real world physics don't apply and aesthetics are encoded in a digital paintbrush. For Semza Digital, we wanted to let users explore Anva's art world in an interactive way. One where you can create your own unique work that still sits within its aesthetics and theories. This allows for you to collaborate with Anva to make something new and continue his idea of the exploration of the square and the circle. From examining his prolific body of work, we set out to encode his iconic motifs into generative paint. So we thought we'd start from the basics, a simple circle inside a square. And so the first paint became the squircle. This is one of Amber's most popular and minimal visual elements and in keeping with how he used it. The squircle paint allows the user to create large fields of color that can be overlaid on top of one another, creating new shapes with the intersections. So on the left, you can see art, uh, one of Shems's artworks and the direct inspiration for the squircle paint. On the right, you can see the digital uh, paintings that we've created using that paint. For the second paint, we really like this knitted woven pattern that I've shown you in a lot of Amber's works. So here we've got the wall that was on the cover of the other story. And perhaps this motif is most directly related to Amber's ancestry of carpet makers that I mentioned earlier. So these lattices of semicircles and squares are some of Amber's most detailed and complex work. The users can explore this complexity through the weave paint that overlays the lattice at different scales with each new stroke and creates webs of intricate and beautiful patterns. Our last paint developed emergently from our experiments and was kind of a happy accident. We were exploring within the limitations of circles and squares and we discovered the mosaic paint. So this accident couldn't have happened without Amber's design aesthetics and like the weave, the mosaic adheres to a kind of grid-like structure that overlays circles and circular rings on one stroke and then squares on another. The mixings of these shapes can result in a minimal look or a really complex one and has echoes of Amber's Islamic geometry influences. And despite this being more indirectly related to Amber's work, Fascinatingly, when we then went back to try and find a work that, that kind of spoke to the mosaic paint, we can really see it there in one of the reliefs from his series with the table and chair legs. Um, and this is called Composition with Number Six, which is currently held in the Tate Permanent Collection. So although users can explore these paints individually, of course, they can also create their own unique compositions and it's up to you to create your own vision with the tools that we've given you. And this results in really un unanticipated artworks that remix Amber's ideas and allow you to collaborate with him. I'm just gonna share a very short video now, which is a how to use the digital painting application. And I will drop the link in the chat at the end of the talk so that you can have a go yourself. Hit the Paint Now button and you'll be taken to the painting application. To start painting, click and drag your mouse or finger in the centre of the canvas and you will start creating shapes with our digital paints. To change your paint, click the icon in the bottom left. This changes between the squircle paint, the weave paint and the mosaic, which all have different aesthetics and different themes based on my grandfather's work. You can change the colour of the palette that you're using by clicking on the colour icon. To undo a shape, click the undo button. Once you've finished creating your painting, you can submit it to our online archive to see it there with all of the other people's work. Click the finish button and then type in a title for your painting and your name and click submit. The image that you've created will automatically be saved to your desktop, tablet or mobile device and you can use it as a digital wallpaper or print it out and have it at home. 
We'll use the digital paintings that everybody has created at the end of the project next year to create an interactive light installation so you'll be able to see your work take shape in that new form. So we, we have been so excited to see what people have, have created with this. We launched the project in November last year at the National Gallery X and um, participation is really a huge part of this collective artwork and it's just the beginning. We've already had since the launch in November 1800 artworks submitted and we're collecting everybody's contributions which you can view, search and explore anytime from our archive web page which is updated in real time as people send, finish their paintings. And as it mentioned in the video, what's really exciting is that from all of these hundreds and thousands of contributions that we hope to collect, we're going to be creating a new interactive light installation next year. And this is going to be driven by all the artworks that everybody has created so far and into the future. And Shemza Digital is a project with multiple forms. So the digital painting application sits alongside an engagement strategy, which invites the public to take part and to increase participation with the project. Through the use of social media, competitions, press campaigns, to the creation of free teaching resources. Um, if you'd like access to those, please let me know. There is a one hour free teaching resource that we shared with schools um, whilst the lockdown was happening just after Christmas because teachers were having to do online content. So if you'd like any access to that, please do let me know after this. Um, and I've also been rolling out community workshops as well and been doing different things um, for museums. So I've, we've had clients such as the VNA, Bournemouth University, Norden Farm Arts Centre and the Festival of Curiosity. One of our most successful engagement strategies was the Shemza Digital competition that was held in February this year. And the competition had over 700 submissions. And out of these 700 submissions, nine winners were selected to have their artworks combined into two collaborative digital artworks. Um, one was a moving image work and another was a 3D animation. So you can see on the left, the winning compositions, the winning artworks. And then on the right, you can see one of the virtual artworks that we created. So the virtual artwork was created for Art in Flux um, we had a re reclaimed exhibition that was launched at the National Gallery at, on the 30th of March this year. And this, I think, was a really wonderful opportunity for the public to have their work exhibited alongside some of the most radical media artists working today. The winner's paintings were exported as real-time animations of the painting process and hung in a 3D space to form Shemza Digital Number 1. By inviting the public to become equal participants in the creation process, Shemza Digital is groundbreaking in showing participatory and community work in a professional media art context. And it reclaims this once elite art and technology world for the public, making art that is accessible to all and hopefully decolonizing the art world in the process. So I'll end with a, um, the moving image work that we created for the competition winners works so that you can see the animation in process and see what that looks like. So the animation is exports of the still paintings. Um, every stroke that the, that the user puts down into the painting application um, comes to life in the animation. So I'll show, share that with you and then I'm sure we can take some questions.
So we found out yes last week that we have been awarded a second grant from the Arts Council England to cover the next stage of this project. And over the next year, I'm going to continue to engage the public through co-creation workshops where the public and I will collaboratively design the installation that's going to be made from everybody's painting contributions. And then we'll hopefully be finding partners to tour it in 2022 nationally around the country. So it's very exciting um, and it's only just begun. So these are my contact details and there's the estate website there, my website, uh, my Instagram and the Shemza Digital Project. And we have newsletters and things like that. So you're able to sign up to them on our website. And I'd be happy to take some questions now. I've been talking for quite some time. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Oh, thank you, Afra. That was amazing. Um, we have, that's great. I was going to say, we have got questions on the chat. So perhaps if you want to answer those first, and then if people want to speak, raise a hand, wave, whatever, we'll open the floor out to them first. But yeah, perhaps if you want to go through the chat first. Um, so we had a question. I'll, yeah, you're I'll, welcome just, to. I'll pinpoint um, the, the first one. And then if you just yeah, sort of want to go through and answer them. Um, the first one is about um, the medium that Shemza used. Was it acrylic paint or what sort of paint was he using? It was oil, oil paint mostly and then um and then obviously with the prints and things that's kind of etching inks and things like that but yeah oil oil paint and he he often used he really often he didn't really mix his colors he used oil out of the tube which is quite um unusual i think but i think that gives that certain vibrancy to the quality of the colors that he was using yeah great um and then we've got um uh, someone asks, uh, it's so sad he destroyed his early work. Um, did he ever express regret for doing that? So not to my knowledge, he actually wrote. So there's some writings from the time where he explains how he's feeling. So it, to me, it's almost like there was an exit. He was having an existential crisis and it was really important that that happened. Um, so there's a long piece of writing where he's talking about how he's how he feels when he's come over to the UK and why he decided to destroy his work and how he sort of says he he was pacing um, up and down his rooms shouting all night trying to trying to figure out what he what is he going to do how is he going to reconcile these two cultures how does he how is he going to sort of fit in in the UK and sort of figure it all out and it's a really interesting piece of writing um, so I think it was really important that that crisis and that um, the destroying of the work so I think it sort of had to happen for him to kind of be reborn out of it. Mm. Mm. Um, and then we have uh, more a comment, I suppose, from Cliff, um, which was the link that you made with Bridget Riley uh, in one of the recent exhibitions and the links to a strong algorithmic approach uh, was the comment made um, between the works, I guess. And I think that comes out even more in the Shams of Digital project. Uh, I mean, I was just watching the video at the end. I'm quite mesmerized, actually. I think the music played a part of that, too. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's another comment. Um, I guess maybe we should open up to the floor and see if there's anyone that wants to ask anything in person um, that perhaps didn't want to write in the chat box. Um, so if you do, uh, just, yeah, give us a wave um, or unmute yourself and ask, ask a question. Go ahead. Don't be shy. If there's anyone out there um yeah june yeah go ahead if you want to unmute first yeah i was just really interested when you were it was a fantastic talk it was, it was wonderful i really enjoyed it um i was really interested in in his how he got from pakistan to the slate and and how he knew so much about abstract art not because because in the 50s we, we forget i remember look, with our hockney exhibition how little information there was generally about art and color color um, reproductions and magazines and books and obviously we didn't have the internet so it's quite difficult to find information about contemporary art unless you were in a big city somewhere so I was just wondering about his decision to go from you know from Pakistan over to the Slade you know what what led to that um, why he wanted to go there and um, how he got he managed to sort of you know get into that Western art mode so quickly. 
I think yes, we, yeah thank you so much Jude it's really good really good questions um I think he there was this idea in in Pakistan at the time many artists left Pakistan to go and study at different art schools in the west so it was kind of something that was that that sort of happened and Shemza was one of the first artists um South Asian artists to come over to London and then subsequently there was um, quite a few more kind of came over. So Rashid Arayin was the next generation down from my grandfather. So sort of that generation. And Anvar's idea was that he wanted to come over to study um, in London. And the, his idea was really always to go back to Pakistan and to teach what he'd learned there at the National College of Art. And they did go back to Pakistan, um, but there weren't, but there wasn't a suitable teaching post for him to take up. So they ended up coming back to the UK and um, taking up a uh, home in Stafford in the Midlands where Mary's family were from. So I think there was always a, a want to return back to Pakistan and to kind of share the knowledge that he'd, he'd had here. And I'm just thinking about some of the other points of your questions. I, I'm not 100% sure how people in Pakistan would know about Western modernism. Um, it, was, it was difficult enough in this country, wasn't yeah. it? You know, in the 50s, I think, to, unless you were in a very small clique. You know, yeah, I are. think um, Amber did some really in-depth research about Paul Clay and even went over to um, visit Clay's son. Um, so he he had actually... So in a sense, he, he was really directing his research and his understanding of those type of those people's work. Um, so that was something he was sort of writing a lot of a lot about Paul Clay's work and was really, really influenced with by his work. Mm. Um, so I suppose he was sort of forging, forging out his his own path to try and understand and educate himself in those areas as well. Now being in Europe, he could travel kind of a bit more around those areas. So, yeah. Oh, it's interesting to think what what his work, how his work would have developed if he had gone back to Pakistan. Mm. Yeah, whether it would have been completely different. Quite possibly, yes. Yeah. Um, Thanks. That was really interesting. Uh, thank Cliff, you. I think we've got a question from you. If you want to unmute and ask if you're still with us. I, I, I really wanted to take the issue to do with the algorithmic approach. I, I mentioned V. Molnar earlier on, but it seems to me that when he when he was talking about his one square, one circle, uh, you then go on to V. Molnar, you then pick up Bridget Riley, who had a very algorithmic approach. And then, of course, what you've moved into has this huge algorithmic background to it. How much was that through, how much you, am I projecting that back to him or how much do you think that was true about his work? I think Islamic geometry, so which he would have been um, kind of surrounded with in Pakistan is very much to do with numbers, isn't it? And to do with kind of a formula and to do with how uh, the geometry is related to the world around us and those all those kind of ideas of beautiful mathematics. Um, so I think he certainly would have had an understanding of those concepts through Islamic geometry, which he would have been kind of surrounded with in Pakistan. I don't know how much he would, I'm not entirely sure how, if he, if there was a kind of computer element, obviously that was very early, wasn't it? I don't know if later on, no, but I think I think the mathematics that relates to geometry, I think, yes, yeah, certainly he would have been working with those ideas in his work and these kind of formulas and the, and concepts that that relate geometry to things that are uh, to the universe, basically, to our connection to one another, to our connection to the universe. Um, are all things that he he I think abstraction really speaks to and certainly is is within his work as well. Yeah, the, the, the geometric element obviously has a, an algorithmic processed, process based approach. Um, but what got me into computing again was there's, there's actually potentially a numeric basis to Islamic art as well, which has an even more algorithmic approach, which clearly predates computing in the sense that we think of it. Um, that, I think that's wonderful. I've loved the talk. 
absolutely gorgeous. Thank you brilliant. so much. Love the work. I love what you're doing with it as well. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank Excellent. you so much. Thanks so Thank much. You. It's been great to see your ever-changing background with all the things that we've got behind it. <laughs> <laughs> Too much energy or something like that. <laughs> great. Is there anyone else out there that wants to? Yeah, Ting, we've got a question. Let's go ahead. Oh, I think you need to unmute yourself first. Can you do that? I don't think. Thought I had. Is that no? Can now you... you have. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Go sorry. ahead. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, you said he couldn't. There wasn't a post for him in Pakistan. Was that almost like, I don't know, a sort of reverse issue where uh, people who who tr um, travelled to the UK were seen as I don't know, not welcome or something. I don't think so. I haven't been, uh, I don't remember that as being something that was has been spoken about with, with grandma, with, with my grandma. Um, I think it was probably just a timing thing. Um, and it was, it has been quite a shame not to have had more, more exhibitions and things in Pakistan, I think. Um, but grandma did go over and do that memorial exhibition in the 80s. And then actually the whole, the whole kind of interest in Shems's work um, more recently came from grandma going over in 2006, I think, and doing some more exhibitions of his work in Pakistan. And that kind of really kicked off an interest here in the UK as well. Um, so I think that's been really Im important um, in kind of getting the getting the word out there. Great. Um, and I know that we need to draw things to a close. So I'm going to open the floor to anyone else. Oh, we've got a question on the chat, Afra, if you want to have a look at that. Uh, I hope everyone can see that. It's talking. Could you talk a little about uh, Anvar's isolationism from the centres of art in the latter part of his life? Um, yeah, it was interesting to see the relief series being made at the same time in a place known for its pottery. So obviously Staffordshire. So yeah, so maybe you want to pick up on that. Yeah, so um, Amber actually created some, there's some sculpture. So there's only, we only have a kind of a couple of pieces that are more related to the uh, Chessmen series that I showed you. So there's a couple of um, ceramic works. And in that time, whilst he's teaching, as some of you might be teachers and artists, uh, he was experimenting with the different mediums that were available to him as well in that environment. So he was printmaking and did a series of women that were exhibited in Australia at the Canberra Playhouse. Um, and that was screen printing. And he experimented with ceramics and did etchings there as well. And then the reliefs. So it was really a, a time for him to kind of experiment and to use the tools and, and items that were there. And also there was another series that he created, which was called the fingerprint series, which, which was uh, an exercise that he was doing with his class for the, his students to um, draw their fingerprints. How would you draw your fingerprints and kind of translate that? And so that comes into his work. So I think there's a really interesting uh, teaching and the idea of teaching students and the, how that all works that related to his work in those later years um, and gave him lots of uh, new mediums to explore with basically. Uh, and I think that isolation from the London art scene just meant that he uh, developed very different work, very bold, very unique artworks that, that wasn't really kind of happening. It wasn't necessarily on trend. Um, and I think that's why it has this quite timeless quality to it. Great. OK, um, thank you. That was a really interesting question. And I think we're probably going to have to bring things to a close. I know a few people have already left us, um, but I'll just say uh, I did put it in the chat box. Um, but whilst I was doing a bit of research for the event, I came across um, 
uh, the After All website have done loads of research into the other story. Um, I don't know if you know about the Afra actually, but it's worth, I've put the link in there and you can do like a virtual, not a virtual tour, but they've got the archive photographs of the exhibition up there. Um, and you can sort of do a zoom around the show and see um, Shamsa's work in there as well. Um, and there's lots of sort of um, essays and stuff about that. It looks like a really great resource. Um, so have a look at that as well. And I'm going to definitely check out some of the exhibitions you've been talking about um, where his work will be on show next year. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll all be back in galleries and things properly then. Um, so yeah, I'm going to draw things to a close. Say thank you very much. And um, thanks to Afra um, for giving us such an interesting talk. And um, yeah, thanks to everyone for joining us. And um, we will hope to see everyone again soon um, and have a lovely rest of the evening. So thanks everyone and good night or good evening. <laughs> thanks so much. Thanks, thanks for having me. It's been thank great. You. Thank you. <laughs> thanks then. Bye.